Hello and welcome to this episode of This Is Your Life. My name is Michael Hyatt and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership. My goal is to help you live with more passion, work with greater focus, and lead with extraordinary influence. In this episode, I'll be talking about the power of our words and how they impact others. You and I probably don't have any tool more powerful for good and bad than our words. And in this episode, I'll be sharing three characteristics of wholesome words and why it matters for you and your leadership. In addition, at the end of the show, I'm going to share with you a tip on how to manage your startup applications. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Platform University, an online membership site for helping you launch your personal platform and taking it to the next level. You can find out more at platformuniversity.com. And if you're already a member, be sure and check out the new member makeover that we just posted yesterday. We took a look at Jen McDonough's platform. She's the host of theirongen.com, and we do a comprehensive review on her site and give her some feedback on what she needs to do to take hers to the next level. So again, check us out at Platform University. You know, our words carry enormous weight, more than we sometimes think, and they often impact people for decades, providing either the courage to press on or one more reason to give up. When I was 14, my family moved from Nebraska to Texas. It was the middle of my ninth grade year, and junior high, as you probably know if you are a parent, is always an awkward time, but the move during this critical year made it even more difficult. And I remember walking into the school cafeteria for the first time. I was all by myself, The other kids had the luxury of established friendships. I didn't know a soul. The cliques were already defined. But after making my way through the serving line, I slid into the nearest open seat, kind of hoping that I wouldn't be noticed. But the kids at the table gave me the quick uh, once-over, wrinkled their noses, and then snickered. I, I had no idea what they were thinking, but I could feel my face getting red with embarrassment. I looked down at my food, again, trying to not be noticed, but finally one of the kids broke the ice. Man, you have such a big nose. I was mortified. I didn't know what to say. Honestly, I wanted to cry, but I think I managed a little laugh like it really didn't bother me. But the truth is it did. Every day from that point forward, I would look at myself in the mirror and all I could see was that big, fat, nose, and it dwarfed every other feature on my body. I studied it from every angle, and I kept coming back to the same conclusion. I was merely a life support system for a nose. It was my defining feature, and that's really all I ever saw for years, for decades when I looked in the mirror. Thankfully, I eventually grew out of this perception, but it literally took me 20 years. Even now, I'm a little self-conscious about it. It just goes to show you how powerful words can be. A careless word can shape or misshape someone's reality for years to come. And as leaders, we have to be particularly conscious of this because we wield enormous power with our words, the power to build up, the power to tear down, the power to influence for good, the power to influence for evil. You know, there's a Bible verse that really speaks to this that I memorized years ago and I've never forgotten it. I often call it to mind in situations when I'm tempted to speak something that would be unkind. And here's what it says. It's from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. I don't intend for this to be a sermon or a Bible lesson, but I think that this short verse from the Bible has some powerful truths that we need to be mindful of as leaders, regardless of our faith perspective. The verse provides three characteristics of wholesome speech. Characteristic number one, wholesome words build people up. This is the meaning of the word edification. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. It's the same word from which we get edifice or building. And other people, the Bible tells us, are temples. You can see 1 Corinthians 3.16 or chapter 6 and verse 19. But as leaders, we have the privilege of collaborating or co-laboring with God to build these living cathedrals. You know, that building power 
is mostly in our words. This is what it takes to develop people. It really comes out of our words. It takes more than just thinking positive thoughts toward people. It takes more than just doing kind words for people. Both of those are important, but the real power, the real juice, the creative power is in our tongue. If you have children, think about what happened when they began walking. You didn't chastise them when they stumbled or they fell down. No, you affirmed what they were doing right. You probably even stretched the truth a little bit in their favor. Great job. That's awesome. You did the same thing when they started talking or drawing or playing sports. We instinctively know that our words had the power to build people up and shape them into different people. But today, do you recognize this in the people around you? Do you see them as the dwelling place of God, as potential cathedrals? I love that imagery. And I mean, this applies to everyone. It applies to your overbearing boss, that rude flight attendant, the stressed out family member. I mean, everybody, all of these people have potential and therefore our words have the power to build them up and help them become the people they were meant to be or tear them down and keep that from happening. So characteristic number one, Wholesome words build people up. Characteristic number two, wholesome words are timely. Timing's everything, right? The right words at the wrong time can be just as damaging as the wrong words. And I remember uh, when one of my daughters went through a breakup with a boyfriend. And to be honest, we didn't really like the guy very much. However, he broke off the relationship with my daughter and she was devastated. Now, there were lots of things I could have said in that moment, like, I told you he wasn't right for you, or I never did like him, or you should thank God you're rid of him. All those would have been true. None of them would have been helpful. Thankfully, I kept my mouth shut, held her close to my chest, and let her cry. Words left unsaid can also be hurtful. And this can happen, for example, when someone does something for us and we fail to thank them or acknowledge them. And I worked for a man for almost two years who only acknowledged my mistakes and failures. I'm going to tell you, it was hurtful. He never acknowledged, never affirmed, never praised me. An encouraging word would have cost him absolutely nothing and meant the world to me, but he didn't do it. And as leaders, it takes discernment to know when to speak and if so, what to speak. The right words spoken at the right time can make all the difference for someone. So characteristic number one, wholesome words build people up. Characteristic number two, wholesome words are timely. But characteristic number three, wholesome words provide grace. You know, this is the ultimate test. It's not enough to have the right words at the right time. Our words have to provide grace, and that's a high standard. And I take this as more than merely being generous or accommodating, though these are both important, but I see grace as the power of God to do his will. You can look up Philippians 2.13 if you want to later, if you're so inclined, but it's the power of God or the grace is the power of God to do his will. And as leaders, our words can either empower people and make them want to press on or diminish them and make them want to quit. And the choice is really ours. I remember one time in my career when I was going through a um, horrific business failure, and I've talked about that on this podcast before, But my partner and I had just lost everything we had. We didn't have two nickels to rub together. And I didn't even know how I was going to provide for my family. Everything was dark. I was devastated. I was discouraged. I was almost despondent. And I called my dad just to get his advice. And I'll never forget what he said. He listened to my story. Great listener. And when I finished, he said, son, you're going to be all right. You're smart. You're hardworking. And you're blessed with a great wife. This is all going to work out just fine. I can't tell you what that did to lift my spirits. It was like a, a, a Red Bull IV for my soul. It gave me the energy to hang in there and keep fighting. And it gave me the grace I needed to do the next right thing for my family and for my business and for my future. So three characteristics. Wholesome words build people up. Wholesome words are timely, and wholesome words provide grace. And since I'm on a roll with the Bible, let me just quote King Solomon, who said in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Every day, we're shaping reality for someone by the words that we use with them. And the choice is ours. 
How will our words impact others? I hope this has been helpful. Frankly, it was a great reminder to me, and that's one of the things I try to do in my podcast when I'm out speaking, is remind myself of the things that are true, try to help myself, and hopefully in the process, help some others along the way. So I'll be back in a minute with our listener Q&A segment. Hey, welcome back. Our first question comes from Christopher. Hi, Michael. My name is Christopher Scott, and I blog at ChristopherScottBlog.com. And my question for your upcoming podcast is if you have any particular sentences or Bible verses that you have as a mantra inside of your head to control your thoughts or maybe to direct your thoughts in the correct direction when you feel the need to. So just curious to hear your thoughts and your experience on that. Thanks for all that you do. Christopher, over the years, I have trained myself to think positively in various situations. Now, honestly, there are situations I get in where, like anybody else, I get down. But I can usually turn that around by saying these words to myself. And again, they're different in different situations. But for example, before I speak, I have a series of affirmations that I I run through because I want to shift my focus to my audience. And I want to think empowering thoughts and not disempowering thoughts thoughts. And to say them out loud, to actually say the words, actually shapes my thinking. So let me just give you a couple of the affirmations uh, that I say. So this is like, before I go on stage, usually before I leave my hotel room, or if I'm in the green room, I say these before I take the stage. So I'll say something like this. I'm not here by accident. God sent me to these people at exactly this time. Or I might say that's because he has a purpose. Therefore, I have a purpose in being here. Now say, I have the energy, the passion, and the message to make a huge impact now and for eternity. Sometimes I'll say what I have to share today is vitally important. It matters to them and their loved ones. And then I always like saying this before I go out. By God's grace, I am prepared. I am strong. I'm energetic. I am outstanding. My heart is wide open. I will connect and make a difference. So what I'm trying to do there is actually give expression to the things that I know are true, but sometimes if they're left unexpressed, uh, expressed, I'll just cave into my uh, darkest thoughts and start feeling fearful, and I don't really have anything to contribute, and what if I get nervous, and you know, it's all self-focused. So I'm trying to focus on the fact that uh, I've got a message to deliver, an audience that needs to hear it, and in my case, as a person of faith, that God is in this with me that he sent me, and he's got a message for me to deliver. So again, great, great question. The next one comes from Jenny. Hi, Michael. Thanks for taking my question. This is Jenny Hester from Henderson, Kentucky. I blog at jenniferhester.com, and my question is, do you have a specific action that you take to keep your words in check? Thank you. Jenny, I don't really have a technique, per se, for keeping my words in check. I guess as I've grown older, hopefully I've grown a little wiser, I'm less impulsive about saying the first thing that comes to mind, although, you know, occasionally I get into trouble with that as well. But, you know, I've done some damage in the past. You know, I've hurt family members, I've hurt people I've worked with, and after a while, you begin to to see the cause and effect relationship, and it's just not worth it. You know, I've had to go and and ask people's forgiveness and apologize and and that's never easy and it's never fun. And if you do that enough times, it's kind of like, I guess, when you're training a puppy. After you know a few times of, of rubbing their nose in the waist, they get the message. I don't know if that's how you train puppies or not. I haven't had one for a long time. But the point is, you know, that's pretty much cured me of it. But what I try to do is just put some distance between the stimulus and the response and take a deep breath and realize that that person may be having a difficult day too, that they don't need to hear something negative from me. But to ask myself the question, when I can think of it, what would be the most helpful in this situation? What could I offer that would be an encouragement? I'll tell you an example. Last week, I had a clerk at an at a airline ticket counter who was clearly frustrated, stressed, and flustered when I came up. And she was, frankly, kind of rude to me. And I just smiled and I said, boy, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be tough. All these people seem to be so demanding. Well, I mean, she immediately opened up to me and she said, you don't know the half of it. And so we had a great exchange, but, but just for a moment, I tried to be human and realized that, you know, I didn't have to get offended, that it wasn't about me, 
that was really about a situation and, and she was having uh, a bad day. I mean, it was, was that simple. It wasn't about me at all. So I think, you know, just remembering that that other person is human and taking a moment to connect with them is one way to do it. And we can do that just by a word of affirmation or a word of empathy or a word of understanding. The next question comes from John. Hi, Michael. This is John Harrison. I blog at johndharrison.com. Richard Farson, author of Management of the Absurd, talks about people learning and responding to what we are. And I believe the words reflect what's inside a person's heart. So while the words and reality may align, is it not our mindset that does the primary shaping? And what if the words are just a symptom of something bigger? So here's my question. How much investment should an individual place in examining and correcting their own language? I look forward to your answer. Thanks. John, I want to make sure that I understand the question and maybe the question behind the question, but I think what you're saying is if the words are only a reflection of our mindset, is it really worth the investment to correct our language? Because after all, the problem starts with our thoughts. And, and you're exactly right. You know, our thoughts create our words, our words shape our actions. All of these things are interconnected and you could start with any one of these. But I think the key thing is, is that they're interconnected. Sometimes, for example, I may be discouraged and not feeling particularly energetic. And one of the best things I can do is get up and go out for a run. Because by focusing on an action, taking action, it can actually influence my psychological well-being. It can have an impact on my spirit. So the body sometimes influences the spirit. Same thing with words. Sometimes I can say something and express it and it will shape my thinking. For example, I, I may have a fight with somebody in my family and I may not be particularly loving or feel loving at that moment, but to just say, look, here's the most important thing. I love you. It may not be a feeling, but it's an action. It's a commitment in my heart. And to express it out loud, those words will actually shape my thinking. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, but I do know this. They're all interrelated and I think all of them are important. But really, for the sake of, of this particular podcast, I was just focusing on our words and the importance that they have. You know, one thought, by the way, is, you know, in the beginning, the Bible says God created the heavens and the, and the earth. And the way that he did it was he didn't think them into existence. He didn't even make them by taking a series of actions. He spoke them into existence. And so I think that speaks to us of the creative power of our words. The next question comes from William. Hi, Michael. I am William Stonewall Monroe. I blog at stonewallmonroe.wordpress.com. As an engineer and a songwriter, I am a strong believer in the power of language, and so I'm excited to hear your message on how words shape our reality. My question to you is, how do the words we use affect our ability to sell ourselves? I'm looking forward to hearing the podcast. Thank you for everything. Bye. You know, I saved this question for last for a very important reason, and that's because the words that we speak to ourselves are probably the most powerful words of all. They do shape our perception of our reality. If we're saying under our breath when we make a mistake, golly, what an idiot. And I know people that do this, and you probably do too, and maybe you've done it yourself. You know, that shapes your perception. Or if you say, why do I always do that in this situation? You know, it shapes your reality. And certainly in a situation where you're trying to sell yourself, if you're going in, for example, to uh, an employment interview and you're saying to yourself, gosh, I'm too old for this, or I'm, I'm overqualified for this, or I'm underqualified, or I don't have an experience, or I don't have the right experience. I mean, all those things, all those words that we're telling ourselves can create a story that we begin to believe and it leaks out of us. So that people can perceive it. And I, I often tell a story when I, I speak on this topic, change your story, change your life. Um, a friend of mine who looked for, for a job for years, he was unemployed for about three years, and he thought he was too old, and he's about my age. And I thought that gave him some wonderful advantages if only he could perceive them. He had more experience than the other candidates. Um, you know, he was battle-tested. Uh, but he saw himself as too old, and people picked up on that, and they just kept turning him down. And so he had to make a shift in his thinking and in his self-talk and in his story in order to get a job. And thankfully, he did a few months ago. Well, hey, now it's your turn. Question, how have mere words positively or negatively impacted you? I'd love to hear your story. 
and you can share with us on my blog on this episode in the comment section. All you have to do is go to michaelhyatt.com slash 63 as in episode 63, michaelhyatt.com slash 63. I'll be back in a minute with some announcements and our tip of the week. Okay, a few quick announcements. If you're considering launching your own platform or just getting serious about it, you need to start with a self-hosted WordPress blog. This isn't as complicated as it sounds. In fact, I've put together a step-by-step screencast on exactly how to do it. You don't have to have any technical knowledge. I'll walk you through the entire process in exactly 20 minutes. And by the way, I just updated this screencast a few weeks ago, so it has the latest and greatest information Available. The screencast is absolutely free, and you can find it at michaelhyatt.com slash WordPress setup. Second announcement, the SCORE conference for this fall continues to fill up. We're at about 70% of our capacity, and we will sell out. And whether you're a professional speaker or just want to be, this conference will teach you how to prepare with focus, deliver with confidence, and speak with power. We've had literally thousands of students go through this over the years, and honestly, this conference has had a bigger impact on my career than any conference or seminar I've ever attended. It revolutionized my speaking. It's influenced every aspect of my communication, including my blogging and my podcasting. And my business partner, Ken Davis, who originally developed the SCORE conference, and I will be hosting this fall's conference on October 14 through 17 at the beautiful Park Hyatt Beaver Creek Resort in Vail, Colorado. And if you're serious about becoming a better speaker, you simply must attend. We'll give you the tools and the confidence you need to prepare and deliver more impactful speeches. You can find out more at scoreconference.tv. Third announcement. My next podcast will be on the subject of two types of thinkers, which are you? And this is on the difference between abundance and scarcity thinking. So, so very important. And I want to talk about why you need to be an abundance thinker and how you can do it. If you've got a question about this topic, please leave me a voicemail message at michaelhyatt.com podcast question slash podcast question. This is a terrific way to cross promote your blog or website because I'll link to it in the show notes, just like I did with the callers in this episode. And now let me leave you with one final tip. I want to talk to you about being strategic with the programs you load on your computer at startup. You know, if you're not careful, these can eat up a ton of memory and affect the speed of your computer. On the other hand, it could be a huge time saver to load automatically your most used applications. And for me, that's things like Mail and Chrome and Evernote and so forth. Well, there's a little program that can manage all that. It's called Startupizer. That's all one word, Startupizer. And there's a link in the show notes. But as far as I know, it's only available for the Mac but it allows you to have different startup configurations. For example, when I'm out speaking, I want the most minimal configuration possible. I really only want Apple Keynote loaded, which is how I present my slides, so that I have enough memory to run video and audio without the system choking, which has happened to me in the middle of a presentation before. Well, Startupizer allows me to do just that. I hold down a modifier key, like the control key or the option key, and it loads an alternative configuration. Very cool. Very simple, very easy to use. And it's only $9.95. And you can find it at gentlebytes.com, B-Y-T-E-S, gentlebytes.com slash startupizer. There's a link in the show notes. And by the way, that's not an affiliate link. I don't get anything for promoting it. It's just a very, very helpful tool in my toolbox. And I thought I'd share it with you. Well, that's it for this episode of This Is Your Life. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please show the love by going to michaelhyatt.com slash love and tweeting a link to the show. I'd be so grateful if you'd do that. That'll help us get the word out. If you'd like to comment on this episode, please go to michaelhyatt.com slash 63 is in episode 63. Go to the show notes for this episode and scroll down to the comment section. I'd love to hear from you, whether it's a comment, question, whatever. But until next time, remember, Your life is a gift. Now go make it count.